I was born in Poland and of course the communist Poland and contemporary China uh, had very much in common. So I managed to obtain a book by George Orwell, 1984. I borrowed it to my friend and he reported me to the police. When you talk about Chinese government, and because the Falun Gong is really formidable opposition, it's not a question of me myself standing in Martin Place with you posters and criticizing Polish authority. You do it regularly. You publish newspapers, you publish books. So certainly they must hate you much more. And uh, considering, yes, how brutal Chinese authorities are, uh, they possibly will attempt either to capture some people if they could or, or punish them in some other ways. Thank you for joining me. My name is Christine Lin. I am the creative director at Friends of Falun Gong. FOFG is a nonprofit organization in the U.S. formed in the year 2000 to support the freedom of belief of Falun Gong practitioners worldwide. Falun Gong is a spiritual practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. It consists of moral teachings and five sets of meditative exercises. Practitioners of Falun Gong follow the tenets in their daily lives, and although it originates from China, the practice is now banned and persecuted in China today. Since 1999, the Chinese Communist Party has been severely persecuting the members of Falun Gong by imprisoning them without trial, torturing them in secret jails, and even removing their organs for live transplantation. Each year, Friends of Falun Gong presents a human rights award to an individual or an organization that has made significant contributions in raising awareness about this horrible atrocity. This year, we are pleased to announce that the honoree for 2021 is Dr. Sev Ozdowski. Dr. Ozdowski, based in Australia, is the Director of Equity and Diversity at the University of Western Sydney and Adjunct Professor of the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies in Sydney University. He was the Australian Human Rights Commissioner and Disability Discrimination Commissioner from 2000 to 2005, and he has also headed the Office of Multicultural and International Affairs in South Australia for five years. Since 2016, he was the Australian Council for Human Rights Education, and he is also the president of the Australian chapter of the World Organization to Investigate the Persecution of Falun Gong. Today's interview will be a chance for us to get to know Dr. Ozdowski and his work in regards to Falun Gong. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Ozdowski. And, uh, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your background and how is it that you came to learn about Falun Gong and get involved? Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you and allow me to say at the beginning that I'm delighted to be a recipient of the Friends of Falun Gong Human Rights Award for this year. It's really fantastic. It's totally unexpected and thank you. Uh, now, how uh, did I learn um, about Falun Gong and how I got associated? Well, you see, I was born in Poland and of course the communist Poland and contemporary China uh, had very much in common. They had similar totalitarian systems. Uh, also, I must say the atrocities which uh, were happening in China uh, especially during the Great Leap Forward, were much bigger than they ever happened in Poland. Poland is a country of only about 40 million people, and 40 million people or more were killed during the Great Leap Forward. But I understand the communist system, and not only, you see, being born after Second World War, there were still memories of Hitler's Germany, which was occupying Poland. And uh, as early as in September 39, uh, my family was exiled from uh, Western Poland, Poznan, where we lived, uh, to General Gouverneur, which was in Eastern Poland. Many members of my family were killed. Some of them died in Dachau, Dachau concentration camp. Uh, so we were talking quite much about it uh, after uh, when I was a child. 
then of course uh, when communist poland was established in 45 there was an ongoing uh, prosecution and harassment of my family because they were quite large property owners before Second World War, and they were also civic society leaders, and neither Nazis nor Soviets liked it very much. Uh, so uh, it was it was part of a bringing where you had stories or you dealt with governments which were really not your governments. I remember, for example, the uprising in Poznan in 1956, where tanks were rolling, plenty of people were killed. I was a boy then of seven years old, but certainly I remember very vividly all the shootings, which was done by Polish and Soviet soldiers against the workers who simply rebelled because uh, there was not enough bread. They just couldn't buy enough food to support themselves. Uh, so I also, during university, was arrested a few times by the communist authorities. Usually there were small things, but associated with disobedience towards, towards communist authorities. And one, uh, it was interesting, I managed to obtain a book by George Orwell, 1984. I borrowed it to my friend, and he reported me to the police. So early in the morning, Secret Service came to our apartment, did a thorough search, I was arrested. It was this kind of a nonsense harassment, which was quite regular in Poland, I knew. So basically, I and my wife, we escaped from Poland in 73, settled as refugees for two years in uh, Germany, and uh, then uh, came to Australia in 1975. Uh, at the beginning, of course, it was establishing myself. We were working in factories. Then I got my PhD scholarship, but I was getting information from Poland that my family was quite severely harassed uh, because we escaped from Poland and Polish authorities didn't like it very much. Uh, so I went and did a hunger strike in Martin Place in the center of Sydney, and, and it was very effective yesterday. It, it didn't do much to my family afterwards. My parents even got a passport and were, they were allowed to visit uh, us uh, in Australia. So as you see, I understand in a way the climate of communist oppression, and in a way, it was kind of a background which drew me uh, closer to, to the Falun Gong people. Mm -hmm. And that's incredible about your hunger strike, because that says to me that we in free countries, when we stand up for those who are locked up in communist countries, it does make a difference. And It does make a difference. It works, because the bottom line is they are selling ideology. They'd like to have our loans or they like to sell their goods. And anybody who creates them a problem, who is impacting on their reputation, it costs them money and they hate it. It was very difficult to shoot me in Sydney, so it was simpler <laughs> to, to let it go and, and let right. me live my own life and not to create too many problems to my family. Right. Of course, they have tried to shoot people in Sydney and wherever they may be. I remember there was an incident in South Africa where a practitioner, Fong Gong practitioner, was uh, chased down by a gun. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's when you talk about Chinese government and because the Falun Gong is really formidable opposition, it's not a question of me myself standing in Martin Place with you posters and criticizing Polish authority. You do it regularly. You publish newspapers, you publish books. So certainly they must hate you much more. And uh, considering, yes, how brutal Chinese authorities are, uh, they possibly will attempt either to capture some people if they could or, or punish them in some other ways. Yes, and that's something that I want more people to understand is that you see an innocuous uh, meditation exercise and you think, what could the CCP possibly have against that? But really, the very nature of 
truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance is completely antithetical to the communist ideology, and that's why it's so threatening. And I think a lot of people don't. Possibly they do not worry about meditation that much. They would worry much more about discipline. They would more worry much more that you are honest people and people who are very difficult to corrupt. And you are the kind of people who believe into a set of values which is not necessarily supported uh, by the Communist Party of China. And I think it is, it is the key thing. And in a way, I remember when Falun Gong movement was prohibited in China, the last straw was uh, that you had some uh, practice in, uh, I think, Beijing. And it was done in such an orderly way. So communist authorities said, oh God, if they can organize themselves that well and enforce that discipline that well, they could be an enemy. Let's talk about how you got involved with the the movement specifically. You became eventually the president of the uh, World Organization to Investigate yeah. the Persecution of Falun Gong yeah. in Australia. Yeah, you see... Uh, uh, basically, I'm a person who is non-religious person. I was educated in a, a Catholic, strong Catholic family. I was even an altar boy for God knows ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm no longer a believer. But still, I'm a very Christian in terms of my uh, tradition. I do not believe into a God figure somewhere there, but I really. Uh, deliver, uh, believe very strongly into humanity and also into freedom of religion. Uh, so my first experience with uh, Falun Gong people really grew out of my curiosity. There was a number of practitioners, uh, especially in Chinatown in Sydney, uh, distributing various pamphlets. Uh, so I took some of them and uh, read a few of them. Uh, and also a bit uh, relates to my stubbornness, because I wanted uh, to learn a bit more. And when I mentioned to other people ab uh, about, about uh, Falun Gong, there was plenty of skepticism or even hostility. People were telling me it's a sect, keep away from them. Uh, so I thought, oh, better, I will learn a bit more. Uh, so, uh, of course, in my background, I was at that stage Human Rights Commissioner of Australia. So there was also a plenty of deep commitment to individual freedom, to democracy, to equality. And basically, I uh, found uh, that Falun Gong people talk exactly about the same things that in addition to the religious commitments, they look for equality, they look for social justice, they simply like to practice uh, the religion. I was also interested in China. For me, it was a very exotic, exotic country. I read some time ago uh, Edgar Snow about Mao. I read uh, a bit of other literature. Then I went a few times to China and the bells started ringing because uh, I was meeting with high-ranking government officials, party officials. I even was taken in Beijing uh, to a party school near Beijing and also, also to the Polish headquarters, even given some kind of commemoration medal. And it was looking more and more like what I've seen in Poland. It was it was really bad. And then when in 2006, when I stopped being human rights commissioner, I've got um, I found that Kilgur, David Kilgur, David Mata's report about organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners. And uh, the report at first was quite delicate and stated uh, that there is uh, over uh, 41,000 of transplants in China in five years time, which can't be explained, the source can't be found. And I read it and what I was impressed, it was methodology, how they collected data and how careful they were withdrawing the conclusions. So I started to be much more interested and I started 
uh, following various other writings in this area. And you possibly would remember Manfred Novak, uh, the Czech scholar, uh, who uh, was uh, the special reporter of UN dealing with China. And he said that the Matas and Kilgur report creates a very coherent picture uh, that is causing major concern. Then uh, the United Nations Committee Against Torture demanded a full explanation of the sources of Volga transplants from a Chinese government. It was 2008. And then I remember Eta Gutman, which was looking again at Falun Gong. And she not only said that up to one million Falun Gong members could be imprisoned, uh, but also that 10,000 of people are being uh, taken to hospital and their organs harvested. And then, of course, I invited Matas to Australia twice for various conferences. And then in 2009, they published the Bloody Harvest, the killing of Falun Gong for the organs. And what was interesting at the time, also plenty of information came that Chinese hospitals are selling organs. So it was done for commercial purposes. So I observed what was happening in the literature, especially dealing with human rights. And I must say that issue is far away from being close, uh, but it's coming closer in a way uh, to, to, to uh, better reporting because just a few days ago, I think it was in June 18th of June, the UN human rights experts expressed alarm at uh, forced organ harvesting in China. As a matter of fact, before we spoke, I was trying to find a copy of uh, that uh, statement, which, which was sent to me a few days ago on the internet, and I couldn't. Uh, it looks that Chinese already blocked all the sites, or, or, or uh, I don't know what they did, but it's almost impossible to find UN document, uh, which, which is talking about it. But you see, the issue, the issue is open, and I think uh, the Falun Gong people, because of their persistence uh, and also because of their peacefulness and that uh, quiet uh, determination, are starting to win more and more ground. And when you look at the UN Human Rights Council, which is really quite <laughs> quite a body, not necessarily always impartial and so on. Uh, returning to it uh, recently, it means that, that uh, possibly we are making small progress in chastising China for what they are doing. And in a way, I can't believe it that being caught in 2008 by Kilgo, and when it was publicized, uh, that uh, almost 15 years later, they are still practicing it. Yeah, it's just unbelievable, yes, how in a way uh, the Chinese authorities are immune uh, to public, uh, international public pressure. But it's not, not maybe so, so difficult to understand because when I talk in Australia about it, there are two categories of people who really don't like to listen or they are not willing to support uh, Falun Gong people. Uh, so the organ harvesting and the prosecution is finished. And I would say one category of people are the kind of people who are saying, listen, it's just not possible. Humans do not do this kind of things to other humans. It's, it's we are in 20th century. So we need to really uh, to, to believe Chinese authorities when they are saying no, it means they are not doing it, some kind of people who are having grudge against the Chinese authorities. And in a way, it reminds me a very interesting story about Jan Karski, who was Polish resistance fighter, and he was sent by a Polish underground to Auschwitz to document uh, the concentration camp. And after it, he was smuggled to the West. He went to Washington, D.C., where he met, it was arranged by Polish ambassador, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, who was of Jewish background. It was in Washington, uh, 1942. 
And when he told him about Gazan people, about mass execution, about starvation, about all inhuman conditions in Auschwitz, uh, Frankfurter simply say, said, listen, uh, I must say, I do not believe you. It just, just not on. It's not possible. And was first fully documented report to American authorities about Holocaust of Jews in Hitler's Germany, and Americans just refused to listen to it. Similar things. There were similar reports and information sent to Churchill, also around 41, 42. Uh, they decided to neglect it and not to do anything because they simply couldn't believe it into it. And there is quite a number of people when you mention that organs could be commercially harvested from people would say, oh, yeah, talking rubbish. It's too difficult to believe it. But then there is also another uh, people who, who prefer to turn a bit of a blind eye to this inconvenient truth and quite often academics who do have uh, contacts with China, they, they prefer to have their contacts and they know if they would take public stance, uh, possibly they'll be banned for, uh, from traveling. There's also plenty of uh, politicians in Australia and possibly elsewhere who possibly some of them would feel some ideological affinity with China, uh, some uh, others uh, like again to travel, some others are receiving uh, donations uh, from from uh, Chinese uh, authorities or the parties are receiving donations. So, so there is a corruption of some kind of uh, political processes. Then, of course, uh, when China became factory of the world, plenty of business people prefer business and saying, no, no, leave human rights aside because it's not our business. And of course, always you get the category of people who are too lazy to search for information and inform themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's particularly striking, the first category of people you mentioned. I think it's particularly because people are mostly and fundamentally good that they can't yeah. believe something so evil could exist. Um, and there's yeah. a book called The Big Lie that talks about that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they just don't believe that it's possible. Right. Yeah, They are good people. And, and they are saying, no, no, it must be propaganda or some kind of ideological war. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, it's unfortunate. And looking at this Justice Frankfurter, he was a man of very, very high intellect, U.S. Supreme Court. He was also a man of Jewish faith. Uh, so it was basically people of similar faith who were prosecuted, but he just refused to 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 take it and he uh, in a way became upset and walked away mm. and as to the second group of people i mean the ccp is increasingly being held accountable particularly after the pandemic that was originated in wuhan china and i, I think a movement is already afoot to hold them accountable for all the things that they've done including the persecution of falun gong and others it's it's help because it removed from Chinese legitimacy the way how they handled uh, the uh, COVID-19, or as I prefer to call it, Wuhan flu. Uh, the, the way they handled, the way how dishonest they were with passing the information and so on, it undermined the reputation as a state which is more or less responsible and controlled things. Uh, plus, plus uh, there is also that uh, suspicion at the moment that it could be uh, connected with Chinese military industry. Uh, so, uh, so uh, until it's cleared or explained, I think I think the trust in China has been lost, and and not only in in, in democratic countries which which were sympathetic, which were pro-Chinese, especially till till eighties. Uh, but also in developing countries, because when you look what's happened in Brazil or what's happened in some other developing countries, and when you think it came from China and so many people unnecessarily died, uh, people are starting to, to wonder uh, about it. And um, so I want to kind of turn our attention to Australia, because that's where yeah. you are. 
uh, how would you describe the situation with Falun Gong in Australia? Because the CCP has its fingers all over the world and is trying to pull strings and influence, uh, you know, put their agenda wherever uh, they go um, through different organizations and espionage and all those things. Um, what is the unique situation in Australia? Well, you see, if you uh, ask me about infiltration by CCP agents of Falun Gong in Australia, I can't tell you much because simply I don't have that information at hand. Uh, but clearly Falun Gong is a formidable opposition uh, and they must be a big target for secret services of a Chinese Communist Party. Uh, in uh, uh, fact, what really was an eye-opener for Australians, uh, it was in 2008, prior to the Beijing Olympics, in Australia, Falun Gong organized the touch relay, Olympic touch relay, which was in a way in competition with the Chinese government touch relay. So Chinese hated it. And in a way I took part in a visit in Sydney and was even delivering some speeches and cutting the torch. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when the torch went to Canberra, the Chinese government response went too far. It was really alarming. They basically ordered and mobilized something between one and 2,000 Chinese students in Australia, put them on buses, sent them to Canberra, gave them flags, which arrived on Chinese plane three days earlier to Sydney and they distributed it. It was very well organized. It was organized with military presence. And basically the Chinese pro Beijing students attacked the Falun Gong practitioners and other people who were carrying this alternative Olympic torch. And there were brawls in, in, in Canberra uh, because, uh, because uh, Chinese students became in a very aggressive way. Uh, so for us, it became in a way a signal, be careful, because if they can organize the Chinese student to this extent uh, that it creates violent clashes in Australia's capital, uh, let's, let's work uh, a bit on it. I'm not sure what, what our secret services did with it because uh, of course everything is shush, shush and quiet, but I'm sure that, that uh, at least additional money was put into areas working uh, on uh, Chinese uh, infiltration of Australia, we didn't have a repetition of it. But when when you look at whole range of other areas, so we already spoke a bit of politicians, and they were quite a number of them who were taking money or going for China junkets or what they like, joining boards of various companies in China and getting money out of it. Even, even there was a Labour senator, Sam Dastiari, who had to resign from the parliament because his pocket expenses were paid by Chinese uh, businessman, and when it became public, he had to resign from the Senate. So clearly the, the, the uh, Chinese are trying to infl infiltrate the political spectrum in Australia. Uh, and uh, they are doing it reasonably successful. Another thing is the issue of trade and commerce. And Australia was uh, unwise enough to lease the port in Darwin for 100 years to Chinese and to sell them half of the port in, in Melbourne. There was a whole range of other investitions of uh, similar uh, nature. The road uh, initiative, the Victorian government entered into it, but federal government put a stop to it and said we won't be part of uh, this initiative. But you see, when Australian Prime Minister called for an inquiry how the COVID-19 originated, official inquiry, 
we were slapped by enormous tariffs by China. So, for example, just after a speech by, uh, by the Australian Prime Minister, China retaliated in May by introducing 85% tariff of barley. Soon after, they introduced over 200% tariff of Australian wine. Then they did similar thing to Australian beef and so on and so on. So they were uh, trying to punish Australia for not behaving well enough according to the standards of Chinese Communist Party. And, and our minister has been frozen out of contacts with China and for last year, no Chinese minister took a telephone call from Australian minister. So at the moment, we we clearly do have a problem in our bilateral relations. Uh, but uh, well, it needs to be so. Uh, we we are spending now more money uh, on our defense. We are also doing a whole range of other things. So we'll have to uh, look differently at China because. Earlier, it was this sympathetic view, this kind of a view where one was hoping that China growing wealthier, developing middle class and so on, will also democratize its structures of government and would be a good citizen of the world. Now, now it doesn't clearly work. So, And of course, another area where the influence is the biggest is, is Australian universities, impact on education. Uh, universities in Australia are a bit leftist, if I could say so, and uh, they uh, regarded uh, China as, as, in a way, uh, ideological friend, uh, and uh, and uh, they welcome Confucius Institutes, uh, and uh, and um, uh, there was plenty of scholars working with China. Uh, especially uh, in uh, areas of interest to China. So we had our scholars working even in Wuhan Institute, not talking about whole range of other areas of technical nature, which were useful, or for example, with face recognition technology, which was later used against Igor people. So, so now the government put a legislation which restricted quite significantly uh, cooperation uh, with with China. It's also well known that that Chinese consuls in different cities certainly will go and see president of the university if there is a lecture or presentation uh, given about Tibet, Hong Kong, about Uyghurs, about Taiwan, and uh, if, the, if the presentation is not sympathetic to Chinese point of view, then they simply will demand uh, that the lecture is sacked or that the meeting isn't taking place. Or recently in Brisbane, in one of the universities, when students decided to um, do demonstrations, pro Hong Kong demonstrations, uh, the pro Chinese students, pro Chinese Communist Party students came and bust them up. <laughs> so, 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 so it's it's happening. As a matter of fact, only only three or four days, Human Rights Watch uh, released a report on harassment and surveillance by CCP authorities of Australian students, and the report. It's quite well documented. Uh, they did interviews with pro-democracy Chinese students at, at our universities. And they concluded first thing that uh, Australian universities, the hierarchy, tends a blind eye. They don't uh, like to see it and, in a way, cooperate with uh, Chinese authorities in Australia. Uh, that the uh, consular officials of China uh, are uh, threatening people. Uh, one of the students, for example, was threatened that if he puts uh, something pro-democracy on Twitter, he will go to prison on his return to China. Uh, basically, they demand that students self-censor themselves. And uh, then the families of students who misbehave in Australia are visited by police in China, and some parents even lost, lost their jobs. So if you ask about 
this infiltration. I can't give you 100% about what's happening with Falun Gong, but I would say it's massive. And it's not only Falun Gong, unfortunately, it's, it's happening everywhere. And we clearly are aware of it and taking measure to limit the impact of the Chinese officials on, on Australian public. Yes, and everything that you described about Australia is happening in the US and in Canada as well, and I'm sure in every country on the planet. The universities in Australia, and I still work at the university, uh, our educational export is the second largest in terms of our budget export. Uh, because we are having about, or at least looking two years back before COVID, we had about uh, 330,000 overseas students, full fee paying students in Australia. And out of it, it was about 127,000 of Chinese. So we are talking big money. So you are having at the university some classes really run only for Chinese students. Uh, and uh, and uh, in a way, our lecturers also quite often complain that uh, Chinese students, because of threat of infiltration and so on, because they are reporting on each other as well to the consulate, uh, that, uh, that because of it, they are afraid of using Facebook or uh, something like it. They are only sticking to Chinese media. So basically, they learned very little of Australian society and what's happening here because they are really close in a little ghetto, being afraid that they could be reported upon or something like it. That's such a shame. So yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Let's let's talk about how liberal democracies around the world should respond to the CCP threat, right? As it's kind of imposing its will and its way of doing things everywhere. Well, well, uh, there is there is, I think, a major change amongst liberal democracies around the world in the way they perceive China and they respond to various Chinese threats. Uh, some time ago, there was this romantic view uh, that uh, that uh, China uh, is a good country, uh, that it's a nation which is very poor, and when it will become a bit richer, it will become a democratic nation, and will be playing the game according uh, to international standards. What's happening now, I think this hope for democratization is gone. And uh, possibly possibly even after Tiananmen Square in 89, there were still some hopes. Some people thought, oh, it's one, it's unusual, it's atypical, it, they had to recover power and so on. Uh, but now I think China lost its international standing. It's not as it was uh, before. So what, what could be done? Well, uh, to, to start with, China is no longer a developing nation. And it should be treated as a world power. Uh, and uh, this, its status needs to be acknowledged. At the moment, China doesn't pay most of the fees or very limited fees to United Nations, to all multilateral organizations because they are seen as a poor uh, and developing nation. China is building plenty of new coal powers uh, because, again, uh, they need to catch up with the West. Uh, the, um, the climate control doesn't impact on China, yes, measures. We all are talking that we'll be carbon free by year 2050. China is saying, yeah, we'll start reducing it about 2060 when we're catching with it. It's, it's plenty of this nonsense with happening. So China needs to be treated, I think, as a world power of, of significant status. And there shouldn't be discount tariffs for China, whatever they do. Then, of course, you see, I was going quite often to UN, to Geneva, to New York, to Bangkok, because its local headquarters are here. And I often was meeting with Chinese delegates. When And, and I was working in human rights, so they were Chinese delegates from the area of human rights. Basically, the 
Chinese were always saying that there are no universal human rights, that there is some kind of a China special human rights, that they are Asian culture, which is different from theirs, and basically that individuals do not count, but governments have got all the human rights, but individuals do not have this right. And I think it's, they especially do not like international covenant on civil and political rights, uh, because the covenant is talking about elections, about individual freedoms, about freedom of religion, association, about trade unions, and so on. So whenever I was in a meeting, they were trying, for example, I was in a meeting uh, working on the new conversions of people with disabilities, and they were trying to remove all the earlier um, uh, clausules dealing with ICCPR in order to ensure that we create a new generation of human rights which won't be impacting on uh, Chinese government. So I personally believe uh, that, uh, that Western nations need to get together because they are only one universal human rights. They were adopted by the United Nations a long time ago. And we can't allow Chinese to be re redefining whole human rights system only because the government doesn't like individual rights. And clearly, clearly, democratic governments need to uh, respond to Chinese on this level. And I'm talking about measured and proportional response. But when you have these uh, violations of Chinese human rights, uh, of human rights by Chinese or aggression, you've got to respond. And in a way, the rights of Falun Gong practitioners should have been dealt 20 years ago, just after Mata's report uh, by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And basically, it's tickling it now when, uh, when the issue is extremely serious, it's possibly the worst uh, massive human rights violation in the contemporary world. Uh, in terms, in terms of uh, practitioners, you see uh, many of them have unique knowledge of China. And it's very important that they uh, share the expertise of China with other members of, of Western society. And uh, they uh, share it through uh, education that they possibly also try to keep as many contacts with people in China as possible and uh, provide the links so the Chinese civil society can survive. Yes, and uh, the effort from on the practitioner side has always been through education, um, through yeah, clarifying yeah, the truth yeah. to people, what exactly is the true situation against all this propaganda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that is really the the most fundamental way to change minds. Um, the CCP will pay students and put them on a bus to do their bidding, but you can't buy a genuine understanding and a genuine heart to do the right thing. No, no. You see, uh, with uh, my experience with uh, Falun Gong practitioners here in Sydney, was that many of Falun Gong practitioners were not fluent in English. Uh, that uh, that they were relatively simple people. I'm not talking about leadership because here yeah, I met also plenty of people who were of high standing with good understanding of the world and so on. Uh, but it's also an issue of learning English, also an issue of getting the position in broader society in the West, and then then trying to combat this prejudice which does exist against any religion in Western world at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because it's not really only about religion. It just happens that you are a religious group organized together. It's about your rights. And the rights are the same for everyone. Yeah, And, and, and therefore, it's so important to, to, uh, to, to work on it. Yeah, and for anybody watching who hasn't met a Falun Gong practitioner yet, uh, as things are opening up, we're you're probably going to see people in yellow t-shirts somewhere, and that's probably going to be a Falun Gong practitioner. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it's really interesting to talk to practitioners because many of them 
came from China and have stories to tell, things that they've seen. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got to tell the stories because they are authentic. They are authentic and people need to know. Uh, so they have enormous role in, in Western society in, in uh, building a bit of people consciousness and, in, and uh, knowledge about China. Uh, but, uh, but also I think they are unique links with uh, the Chinese society and if there is any opportunity of individual contacts or sending a book or something like it, it needs to be done. You see, for example, going back to my story about Poland, what was very important, there were US and BBC radio stations which were beaming into Poland. So we also couldn't trust the information which was coming from the government. So we were listening to Western radio station and we knew much more. And you see, with, with China, what is also very interesting, it's a country which is going through a major difficulty. It looks, it's strong and so on, but its economy needs new structure. It doesn't have a proper structures of running democratic society, you, uh, of running a society. It's possibly the party system they've got, got to its use by date. Uh, also, it's military. It's happening what, what Stalin was doing in 38 with the Russian military. They removed quite a number of commanders and replaced them with security people. Uh, so, so, so it's not that great going. You see, in Poland, I was doing uh, major sociological uh, research after riots of 1970 in Gdańsk, in Szczecin. And we, when we finished the research in 73, we predicted solidarity. We didn't know it will be called solidarity, but clearly the working classes of Poland were so disappointed with communist rulers and the workers who came to factories after the Second World War, who didn't have education and were afraid of the Communist Party, uh, they were, of course, uh, obedient, didn't do much. But the children who've got education, who were saying, we're living in a working class state, so we'd like to have some say, who uh, had to wait 18 years to get an apartment and the parents who got an apartment within two years started to rebel. And it was the uh, group of people which from Valencia and others which challenged the Communist Party and won. Similar thing will be happening in China. When you have a middle class and you are having a bigger middle class now, sooner or later they would demand sharing of power. And especially if there is some kind of economic problem happening. And my view is that the current policies of China will significantly, significantly impact on Chinese economy. I can see, for example, in Australia, government is talking about re-establishment of industrial base in Australia. People are asking in shops, is it made in China or not? It will impact on Chinese economy. When middle classes in Beijing or Shanghai or anywhere else in China will start seeing that their well-being is going down, they will start to rebel. And it's normal. It's normal sociological processes. So I wouldn't take, in a way, everything what's going in China for granted. And and uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps yeah, uh, I can uh, tell you a thing that when I was leaving Poland in '73, uh, there was the impression uh, that Soviet Union will last for another thousand years. It was so stable, so strong, and so on. Sixteen years later, there was no Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. I mean, good will always triumph over evil is what we believe. And uh, you've actually been very outspoken saying publicly that Falun Gong will triumph in the end. The life goes on. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the China is at its peak. Uh, but, but I think it's fragile when you look economically and politically, perhaps also militarily. And I think if you don't built society which is able to vet social discontent through elections or through other things, 
then basically we'll have another rebellion, the revolution. And in a way, when you look at Chinese history going 100 years back, it was going like yo-yo, going mm -hmm. up and down. And part of it, it was that there were no mechanism uh, to use people's energy and passion for the good of the state. Yeah, it's 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 the model of management when you have a, a commander close to deity telling everyone what to do uh, was proven. God knows from the beginning of capitalism that it doesn't work very well, uh, but also the slave state collapsed in Rome uh, because economically it didn't work. Well put, well put. I could listen to you lecture and I understand how your students must really be enraptured when you speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we should wrap this up. Uh, so in conclusion, we are honoring you with the 2021 Human Rights Award. Uh, what would you like to say in accepting this award to the practitioners in China and around the world? And also to anybody who's hearing about Falun Gong for the very first time. Yeah, perhaps three very short things. The first thing would be, remember the victims of communist oppression in China. They are millions of people who perished, who gave their lives because of communist oppression. I think they need to be cherished. I think they need to be remembered. And part of Falun Gong role is not to allow for rewriting of Chinese history, especially now when one read about history of establishment of Communist Party in Shanghai 100 years ago, how many lies were said <laughs> about this history and what's happened uh, to the, I think, 13 or 12 members who established that party. Uh, so, so, so really think of people who are no longer with us, who died by violent means or because of star starvation, and make sure that they have their place in, in history. The second, as I was giving that example of 73 when I was leaving Poland in 89 when Soviet bloc collapsed, stay strong and the future is yours. There is no end of history now with Chairman Xi. And the third one, we also spoke a bit about it, just be ready, just work towards improvement, prepare yourself for a role in the reborn China, because it may happen sooner than you think. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you so much for your perspective. You on this planet are in a unique position with your personal background to speak on Falun Gong issues and all these uh, communist related issues. And I'm so happy that you're able to take up the positions that you have and that you're being so uh, uh, so bold in your advocacy. And we thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you for the award. I will cherish it. And Christian, it was good to talk with you. It was a pleasure speaking with you yes, as well. It's a long day in front of you. Now I think I can go to bed. Have a glass of red and, and, and all the best. Okay, all the best.